If your world was full of infected, blood-sucking zombies, what would you do? Everyone you love has barricaded themselves within walled city stations in order to survive, and it's only a matter of time until the zombies break in and destroy everything. I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the Kabane zombies in Kabaneri of the Iron Fortress. This kid here has no idea that he is about to turn into the one thing he hates most, a Kabane zombie. Ikoma is a brilliant inventor living inside the walled station of Hinamoto, a walled fortress like many others around the area that can only be accessed by highly fortified trains. On a day like many others, Ikoma breezes through his daily work when a train called the Iron Fortress arrives at the station, and he notices a strange girl with pigtails getting off to greet the ruler of the city. And Ikuma interrupts their greeting because he's way too empathetic for his own good and tries to protect this dude who everyone thinks is infected with the Kabane virus. And all of his efforts do nothing more than get him beaten up and thrown in jail. Later on that night though, that very same girl with pigtails bumps into Ikuma who we find out is named Mume. But the pleasantry is cut short because just then another train arrives at the station. But something is not right. This train isn't slowing down. It's being controlled by Kabane zombies. The city tries to close its gate in time, but it's too late, and horror erupts upon the city of Hinamoto. Okay, this is insane, and now everything is about to go to shit. These stations around the nation have been active since the Kabane outbreak when it first began over 20 years ago, but now the amount of stations around the country that are safe and still active have been dwindling thanks to increased Kabane attacks. This means that the station of Hinamoto should have been all the more careful when it comes to security around the station. If we noticed, the guards at night right before the train came were already on low alert, and they expected the train to slow down on their own accord, and as a result left their gate wide open. But if my world had been taken over by Kabane zombies, I frankly wouldn't trust shit, let alone the brakes of a train conductor. These guards, or more importantly, this city station should have had stricter security measures, like for starters. They should have had all trains come to a complete and full stop right before they're about to cross the bridge gate. By doing this, they could have prevented this incident from happening to begin with, by having a policy that all trains will be fired upon if the train does not come to a complete stop prior to crossing the bridge gate, and have the train thoroughly inspected and everyone on board inspected before allowed inside, and then have everything looked over again, before letting them into the actual city. Now, even with the gate closed, this train could have still crashed through it, but the fact that they didn't plan for any of this only goes to show you whose fault all of this really is. We should probably fire those guards. The train crashes into the walled city station and thousands of Kabane zombies are flung into the populated streets. And that's when the horror begins. Left and right, men, women, and even little children are getting eaten alive by the Kabane. Ikoma breaks out of jail and runs back to his lab to get his modified piercing cannon that he created specifically to puncture the Kabane's metal cage around its heart. But in the meanwhile, terror continues to reign supreme and everyone anyone ever knew gets devoured as the whole city gets torn apart. It's every man for himself. Elsewhere, the ruler of the city leaves his only daughter while he tries to clear a pathway to the only escape left within the city, the Iron Fortress itself. Little does he realize that he'll never get there alive. On the way while running back to his house, Ikuma lures in this Kabane zombie on purpose in order to finally test out his modified piercing cannon and see if it really will pierce the metal cage around a Kabane's glowing heart, a Kabane's only weakness. The Kabane lunges and he fires, discovering that it works, that this is a lethal weapon that will kill these undead bastards. But genius comes at a price, because just as this happens, he discovers his worst fear. He's been bitten. The virus begins to spread throughout his body, and Ikuma quickly tries to save himself by tightening a collar around his neck, squeezing the air right out of him, including the virus. And he manages to stop the virus from infecting his brain, retaining control of his body and his mind in the process. Elsewhere, the city holds up in one spot as they wait for their fearless leader, this guy, who is actually now dead, to try and clear an escape route to the train. But Mume, just arriving on the scene, grows tired of waiting and decides 
suffice to clear the route herself, unleashing more hell upon these Kamine than anyone has ever seen before, destroying these monsters with nearly inhuman speed and skill, allowing all these people to finally reach the train to board and get out of there, including Ikuma, who on the way meets up with his best friend Takumi as they sneak onto the train. But it just isn't his day, as he gets discovered while fighting this Kabane that he too is one of them, showing off a glowing golden heart upon his chest, forcing this guy named Kurusu to promptly take him out. But they don't have time to mourn, as the bridge out of the city gets jammed right as more and more Kabane arrive on top of the train. Everyone on the train prepares for hell to be unleashed, but then they notice the most insane thing happening outside. It's Ikuma, alive and human, killing Kabane after Kabane, clearing the track of stragglers and unjamming the bridge, setting the train free. Holy crap, this is a huge deal. Now with viruses in general, it's not uncommon for some people to become infected with a virus only to have their immune system spontaneously clear up the virus from their system, keeping them from developing the actual virus. Now judging from what we can see, we don't know the full situation yet. Ikuma may be somewhat asymptomatic, since he's clearly not acting like a Kabane zombie, or if his immune system may truly be resistant to this outbreak. Now judging from the time period, I doubt they have access to such gene editing technologies like we do today, like CRISPR technology, to enable geneticists to find a way to perform and manipulate the genetics of Ikuma in the hopes of finding a cure. But still, Ikuma could be seriously useful to them. Since the outbreak 20 years prior, literally not one person has been found to have an immunity in any sense to this virus, which makes Ikuma an incredibly rare find I can't even emphasize how much. If Princess Ayame has any sense, she'll tell Kurusu and his lackeys to grab Ikuma and lock him up till they can study him better, because it's doubtful that they'll end up killing the entirety of the Kabane population ever, which means their best bet is finding a cure to this horrifying disease. Because just like an event that happened in 1994, when doctors found a man named Stephen Cron who had been exposed to numerous HIV-positive partners, but was found to have no signs of HIV infection whatsoever. Resistance in any sense of the word to a pathogen is rarely as simple as one mutation made in the body. Rather, there may be several genes and proteins at work that confer resistance, meaning finding a cure with Ikuma in their custody will be hard enough. And without him? Well, they may never get another chance like this again. Takumi then throws Ikuma a lifeline, literally, but Ikuma refuses to grab it, wanting to die rather than be the thing he hates most. But Mume is less of a whiner than this kid is and swoops in to save the day and Ikuma, aiding Takumi in rescuing his best friend. But back on the train, Kurusu still doesn't trust Ikuma, so Mume helps him out by revealing the most simultaneously awesome and horrifying thing ever. She reveals to everyone that she too has a glowing heart, that they're not human nor Kabane, but something in between, calling her and Ikuma a Kabaneri. But Kurusu doesn't care and isn't trusting either of them, until Princess Ayame eases the tension by permitting the two Kabaneri to stay in the boiler room for the rest of the trip. And during the long ride, it is here that we find out that Mume's power comes at a price, and that after heavy battles she passes out due to exhaustion. Surprising Ikuma, she asks him to be her shield when she passes out, and to act as her protector during her weakest moments. And she begins training him to become an actually useful Kabaneri, and to prepare him for what's to come. Later on, however, training is cut short as Mume senses an infected person on board the train, forcing her to go looking, and in the process gets caught by Kurusu again and upsetting Princess Ayame. Suddenly, Princess Ayame gets word that the train needs to stop a bit for repairs, and she decides to hold a vigil for those lost at Hinomoto. As night begins on the frail group of humans, the villagers decide to take action and get rid of Mume and Ikuma. But thanks to Ikuma's good boy nature, he manages to convince Princess Ayame that he's not the bloodthirsty bastard that everyone thinks he is, and just then he passes out. Why? Because his Kabaneri body needs blood to survive. Just then, right outside, Mume finds the infected Kabane that she was searching for, a pregnant woman, and she plunges her sword deep into her sternum, right in front of all of the horrified little children, showing us that no one, not even unborn babies, are safe from this deadly virus. Okay, they just literally escaped hell itself, and now they're acting like they're clear of it? When in fact, it's the complete opposite. They're now exposed and vulnerable, and right within Kabane territory. Let's not forget, we are not behind the safety compounds of no station anymore. We're literally in the Kabane 
Monet's backyard, and they could attack us at any point. They're all over the place. Which means we should seriously be thinking about how to not die, rather than how to honor our fallen comrades. Not to mention, the Iron Fortress is not in tip-top shape right now, and is currently inoperable, at least until the engineers repair it. So we literally have no escape route if shit hits the fan. Princess Ayame royally screwed up this time around, and so did her protector, Kurusu. He especially, as a trained soldier, should have explicitly told her that stopping to create a fire for a vigil was a bad idea. Now, we don't exactly know how good the Kabane's eyesight is, but I'm guessing that their sweet glowing eyes and superiority to us in almost every single physical way, aside from intelligence, means that they can probably see a fire in the middle of the night. Without any obstructions, a healthy but average vision could see a candle flame from as far as 1.6 miles, or from a higher vantage point, that same person might be able to identify objects from dozens of miles away. And that's just regular all human vision. They had no business lighting a flame as big as they did. Rather, everyone should have remained inside the safety of the train while the engineers repaired the Iron Fortress. This would also have allowed for less variables and time spent getting back on to the train if the Kabane were inevitably spotted from afar. However, I'm not a monster, which means if we had to light a fire for our dear old fallen comrades, I would have at the very least taken some precautionary measures when it came to creating a flame. How about one person lighting a candle in honor of all of the fallen deaths, and then we blow it out and then get back on the train. The public is horrified at what Mume has just done, but they suddenly hear the piercing screams of their very dear princess sounding off from within the train. It's Ikuma, and he's about to kill the princess. But suddenly Kurusu comes out of nowhere and knocks him off of the princess just when he was so close to eating her brains. The blow from Kurusu knocks some sense back into Ikuma, who had no idea just what he was about to do. Kurusu begins to freak the hell out and aim his rifle right towards Ikuma's face, but all of a sudden Mume busts in with the worst news of all. The Kabane have found them, and they are on their way here. Terrified, people then begin to frantically scramble to get back on board the train, as even the engineers abandon fixing the train now in favor of starting the engine and getting the hell out of here. But the tension and stress isn't over yet, because the passengers of the train begin to resent Lady Ayame, thinking that she isn't fit to be in charge and strip her of her power, and they decide to lock up the rest of the Kabaneri on board, along with forcing the Iron Fortress to make a change of course on their way to the town of Kongukaku by taking the faster and way more dangerous course course through the mountains. Later on, as the train reaches the sinister mountains, the horrors that await them there are finally unveiled, and it couldn't be more terrifying. Hundreds of Kabane then begin to fall onto the roof of the train, along with an even more rare and even deadlier breed of Kabane known as the Wazatori, or Learner Kabanes, which are samurai-turned Kabane who retain their warrior skills from when they were alive. Okay, we are in some serious shit right now. If you thought the average old Kabane was dangerous, Wait till you come face to face with one of these. This Kabane is one who has lived long enough to gain proficiency with a specific set of skills from their time as a human, enough to retain some or most of its muscle memory in its Kabane form. And for all of you non-gym bros out there, I'm not one of them though, sorry. Muscle memory simply is the form of procedural memory that involves strengthening a specific motor task into memory through repetition. This is synonymous with motor learning, that even if you stopped working out for ages, once you got your ass back in the the gym, all your gains from the past would come back at an exponential rate. Which means even if these Wazatori Kabane took a break from handling a sword, you can bet your ass that their sword skills are still as sharp as ever. Or at least it won't take long for them, even in Kabane form, to get back to their full deadly potential. Which means we need to be extra careful with them. But it's not all bad. Their swords are still just regular old swords. It's not like they're made from adamantium or anything like that. And their physiology and organ structure is still the same as other regular Kabane, which means the safest and most effective way to beat them will be through the use of attrition. They need to overpower it and keep their distance, concentrating their firepower through the use of overwhelming force to hopefully bring this thing down eventually. I'd also forget about every single civilian that were on the train carts that the Wazatori came through, because they're probably already dead. And I would mobilize every single human capable of handling a firearm and fill a single train cart full of every soldier I can. And then I would unload everything that we've got into this Kabane volley fire style. 
Like caged rats, terrified civilians get horrifically slaughtered as the Wazatori Kabane devour each cart they go through. Until Lady Ayame grows some metaphorical balls and finally decides to confront the horrifying Kabane head on, along with Kurusu and his crew, and they slay dozens of Kabane and the corpses pile up. Elsewhere, Ikama and Mume decide to help defend the train, and they break out of their cart, and Ikama darts atop of the train with Mume and head to the front. With Mume's help, Ikama takes out Kabaneri one by one, clearing the top of the train. But all of a sudden, like clockwork, Mume's strength suddenly disappears, and she collapses from exhaustion, forcing Ikuma to fight the Wazatori Kabane on his own. Getting near the front of the cart, Ikuma sees the Kabane zombie down below with the princess, and he begs the humans for some blood in order to regain his strength. And so, Princess Ayame steps up and allows Ikuma to take her blood, allowing him to regain his full strength and kick this Wazatori Kabane ass right off the train, showing everybody just how invaluable these Kabaneri really are. This also prompts Lady Ayame to let them stay on the train indefinitely and begins to supply them with her own blood when needed. And following her example, everybody else joins in on the blood drive. Time passes as the train gets closer and closer to Kongukaku, and Ikuma helps the team improve their firearms and swords with the very tech that he invented for his piercing cannon, preparing the weapons for the hell that could come down on them at any moment. Just then they arrive at Yashiro Station, but something is off. As it seems empty, or perhaps overrun with Kabane, which means that the group must be careful. And to add to their problems, a watchtower has collapsed onto the tracks, meaning there's no way to continue on with their journey, unless they find some way to remove it and get it done quickly. The survivors of this station warn them of a black smog that engulfed the entire station prior. Just then, Mume notices this old man who signals her to follow him outside, revealing to us that she is actually on a mission for her brother. Lord Biba, known as the Master. The old man then tells Mume that they think she's gotten soft, and that if she keeps this up, she'll be permanently disposed of. He then warns her to complete her mission or else. Elsewhere, the team plans to head to the boiler station to operate the crane in order to remove the watchtower from the tracks, and they quickly jot down a slower route to get there. But Mume then suddenly shows up agitated as hell, and she quickly dismisses their plan, opting to instead head straight there and kill anyone who gets in her way. Something seems up with her, so Ikuma warns her to not head straight into the boiler station, because they don't know what awaits them. But thanks to her stubbornness, Mume shrugs it off, not realizing the mistake she just made. Okay, Ikuma needs to seriously reconsider his strategy and find out what the hell is up with Mume, because like any good plan, they need to eliminate as many variables as possible by acknowledging everything that could go wrong, and Mume insubordination already makes her a bigger threat for the entirety of the group, more so than the Kabane are at this current moment. Like any good zombie movie, once areas become congested and full of zombies, with the population around the area dead, it's likely that most zombies would then become dormant due to the lack of nearby stimuli. These are the most obvious factors in this plan that already make it painfully obvious how Mume can screw it up for us. If I'm Ikuma, I would, for the good of the group, knock Mume out out or sedate her and do whatever I have to to take her out of this plan entirely. And I get it. We'll be more vulnerable with one less Kabaneri hybrid, but she could cause more problems than her powers and strength are worth if she runs in guns blazing and then needs a nap after five minutes. At the very least, I would ask her to wait until me and the rest of the team go and scout the area first, making sure that we're not walking into some sort of trap, and then I would call Mume in. The team then sets off and start their plan, arriving near the boiler room station and exit the train, but Mume is nowhere to be found, and they see her naively run in headfirst into the boiler room station, forcing Ikuma to chase after her, not knowing what's behind those doors. Mume then blasts down the door to find a terrifying horde of Kabane, but she continues to do the usual hum and drum routine of kicking ass and taking names, and kills every single Kabane in that room, right as Ikuma and the rest of the team arrive. Ikuma is beyond pissed off, but he doesn't have time for her bullshit 
it, and he gets to switching the lever of the crane. But something is not right, and a soldier notices a black shadow down below the structure, slowly realizing his worst fear. That's not a shadow, but a Kabane horde. Thousands of them climbing up, all thanks to Mume's rush and guns blazing attitude, which alerted them to their presence. The team then scrambles to finish their job, while the Kabane begin to rapidly overrun the platform, and Ikuma tries desperately to continue to operate the crane, but he suddenly sees an exhausted Mume get thrown off the side of the platform. Looks like she got exhausted again. This forces Ikuma to stop lifting the collapsed structure, and he jumps down to rescue Mume, forcing the Iron Fortress to wait for them to get their act together. All of a sudden, a huge eruption occurs and a dark figure rises in the distance, rivaling that of the Iron Fortress. It's the Black Smoke Kabane, just like the survivors described it. The terrifying Black Smoke Beast begins to chase after them. The train makes a steep detour by taking the emergency train line into a fortified garage nearby. But they're not out of the woods just yet. As they discuss about possibly crashing through the collapsed watchtower, since it's already been lifted halfway, and with little other choice, they blast through the garage doors, hoping to get ahead before the dispersed smoke Kabane comes back to chase them. Elsewhere, Ikuma, trapped in a tunnel, tries to dig out Mume, who is pinned down by rocks. But just then, he hears a horde of Kabane coming for them. So like the goody little two-shoes that he is, whips out his modified piercing gun and desperately fights off the Kabane, eventually blowing him and the rest of the overpowering horde up. Later, Mume wakes up to find the crew of the Iron Fortress there to help her, and she spots an injured Ikuma in the distance. But just then, they hear the penetrating rumbles of the smoke demon. It's back. Okay, hold on. Don't we remember when we reached this station? The survivors were already telling us, basically warning us about what took over this station, this black smoke monster. So it shouldn't come as any surprise that the same monster that the survivors told us about is the one to ruin everything. This is a case example of poor listening skills just in general. Another name for this ginormous creature is a fused colony. And that's what this abomination basically is. It is a titanic amalgamation of Kabane, with its signature trait being that it will often take in humans and Kabane dead or alive to grow in size and therefore power. Now, its only weak point is where its heart is, which is actually controlled by a Kabane from within, and this is where this creature draws its powers from. But let's be honest, there's no way that we can actually defeat this thing, and none of these smarty pants have a clue on how to beat it. But what we do have are the fortified train garages that this smoke monster earlier couldn't break into, and we know that this giant beast only appears if we bring enough attention to ourselves. So what I would do would be to head back into the fortified garage and wait however long it takes. And I would play with two options. Option 1, send a squad to operate the crane discreetly and remove the watchtower, this time without catching the attention of every nearby Kabane. Or option 2, send two squads out, one to remove the watchtower and the other to distract any Kabane and if necessary, sacrifice themselves in order for us to survive. And aside from that, there's not much more that needs to be said. The gang then runs back to the Iron Fortress and gets out of Dodge, before the smoke monster has time to assimilate itself. Back on the train, Ikuma apologizes to the annoyed crew, who blame Ikuma for the mess up, but they forgive him all Disney fairy tale style cause that's what bros do. Shortly after, the gang finally manages to remove the watchtower into how to defeat the smoke monster, and to make up for her bullshit, she volunteers to do the killing. And just as planned, the smoke monster finally comes back to life, and charges after them. But with preparations in place, they fire the cannon and blast its chest wide open, revealing the monster's vulnerable open heart being controlled by a female Kabaneri. Mume jumps into the monster to stab it from within, killing it in epic style, imploding upon itself and flinging Mume out, allowing the train to finally get the hell out of there. The days then pass as the Iron Fortress finally arrives at Shitori Station, a lowly station barely left with any food or supplies. So Lady Ayame offers the town some new weaponry provided by Ikuma to grease their palms into letting them resupply 
fortify the Iron Fortress with food and supplies. The next day, as the crew wakes up rested, they finally hear the whistle calls of another incoming train, with the famous Lord Biba riding it. He's a powerful lord and part of an independent, unstoppable killing force. And in a turn of events, turns out that this powerful stud is none other than the brother of Mume herself. But something about him doesn't sit right with Ikoma, and he doesn't trust him one bit. Lord Biba does a meet and greet with the princess, and Mume informs him that there's another Kabaneri just like her, and that his name is Ikoma, and Lord Biba licks his lips to this news. Princess Ayome informs him that within the day, they'll be headed up to Kongukaku. But the strangeness continues, as later on, the princess notices that something is off, because Lord Biba's crew are acting strange. Later in the engine room, Lord Biba fixes his train's engine just as Ikoma spots him and offers to help. And it is here where Ikoma gets the idea of just what kind of man this warlord really is. He tells Ikoma that he believes that the weak around the world deserve to die, and that only the strong can survive. And just then, another Kabane attack occurs, and this time we get a front row seat into just how lethal and deadly Lord Biba and his crew really are, as him and his army take out dozens of Kabane with ease. And out with those monsters pops up the old man himself, that this attack was all a trick to lure Lord Biba out of the station to be murdered. But the old man is too slow for his own good and dies by Lord Biba's hands, who kills him mercilessly right as Ikoma bears witness to it all. Something is not right with Lord Biba, and Ikoma should trust his gut. Now, based on our brief interaction with Lord Biba, we've already learned his radical worldview on everything, which is completely littered with red flags. It is clear by what he said that this dude is a total sadistic nutjob. The weak die and the strong survive. I mean, who talks like that? Lord Biba is a charismatic young leader whom everyone looks up to and respects, and has a way with the masses. Judging from how politically astute he is with engaging people, he is also ruthlessly deceptive, with an extremist mindset. This dude spells trouble, and even though we don't know everything there is to know about him, we already learned more than enough. Even if we asked Mume about her brother, it seems as though he is a lonely guy who is confused about his sense of identity, withdrawn from his own family, as seen by how Mume talks to him, and he's completely fine with violence towards people, and we've just found out about his extreme worldview. And I'm also willing to bet that this mindset comes from him harboring his anger towards something, because no one has this insane of a worldview unless they are either completely nuts or suffering from past trauma. If I'm Ikoma, I would seriously ask Mume everything there is to know about this guy, because not for a second can we trust him. And I would also warn Princess Ayame and Kurusu about him, because even if there's a slight chance that I'm right, based on his credentials alone, being a certified Kabane killer, this guy spells trouble. Just then, Lord Biba's men kill off the high-ranking members of the station in secret, and Biba offers himself to escort Princess Ayame and the Iron Fortress all the way to Kongukaku, out of the kindness of his heart, of course. So the princess accepts, but feels the same thing that Ikoma feels as well, that something is off about this guy. Later, Mume wakes up in a pod, and this scientist reveals that the marker on her body is growing, and her brother asks Mume for a favor, to steal the master key of the Iron Fortress from its owner, Princess Ayame. And like the good little snot that she is, Mume accepts to do his bidding, leaving just as we find out that Lord Biba is even more of a psychopath than we could ever realize. And we see two men tied up within his dungeon Kabane filled lair, who turn out to be spies for the Shogun of Kongu Kaku, and who set up the old man to try and kill him. Lord Biba then interrogates them even further, and finds out that it was his father, Lord Biba's actual father, who left him to die on the battlefield 10 years ago, during a fight with the Kabane, cutting off supplies for his army, and causing thousands of his men to die as a direct result. In another part of the train, Mume eerily enters the room of the princess, and she asks her for the master key, but the princess knows something is off, and questions her about it. Suddenly, Mume reveals a blade from her right hand, threatening the princess that she better do as she says. But luck has never more been on Princess Ayame's side, as pink-haired conductor girl overhears the whole thing and swoops in to save her, entering the room and claiming to already be in possession of the master key, and she hands it to the eager Mume. 
Mumei, whose demeanor suddenly and completely changes as she happily leaves the princess's room. Close call. And we later find out that pink hair conductor girl simply gave Mumei a random key in order to distract her. Just then, Takumi busts in and tells the princess that Ikoma has found some kabane being held right in Lord Biba's train cart, and they rush off to find out just what the hell is going on. Mumei, thanks to her brother, realizes that they gave her the wrong key, and now pissed off and on the orders of her sinister brother, Mumei goes out to prevent Ikoma from entering their train cart, distracting Ikoma by telling him the truth itself, that they keep the kabane in there for research purposes, and that Mumei herself chose to become a kabaneri with the help of her brother, and to not be weak like humans. And she closes the door on a heartbroken and shocked Ikoma. Later on, the Iron Fortress arrives at Wato Station, the last stop before Kongukaku. But the leader of the station isn't letting Lord Biba through without a talk. And while Lord Biba heads off to play nice with the leader of the station, Ikoma tells everyone the horrifying truth about the Kabane being on board the train, causing everyone to be suspicious as hell about him, and even Lady Ayame. And she tells Ikoma to go rescue Mumei. Okay, now I think would be the time to snoop around a little bit on Lord Biba's train in order to find out what the hell his plans are in certified writing. Because at this point, we cannot afford to sit around and wait for Lord Biba to escort us to Kongukaku. We won't make it. We need to get the hell out of here and warn the Shogun that the Master Kabane Killer is planning to pay him a visit. Aside from that, I would also say screw finding Mume and use Lady Ayame to our advantage by repairing and refueling our train ASAP and get out of Dodge. By manipulating the princess and her master key, we have all that we need to make a speedy getaway, which means I wouldn't waste the time trying to save Mume. To keep Lord Biba's attention away from us, however, I would convince the princess to hand over her master key, on the off chance that she can't make it back. Because let's face it, she's royalty and there's probably a reason why Lord Biba has stuck so close to her this entire trip. He's up to something and we can smell it. So while she plays her princess role to distract Lord Biba, I'd use this time to prepare for our getaway with everything we need close by and available. Because reaching Kongukaku before Lord Biba is the only way that we can realistically save everyone on the Iron Fortress. Princess Ayame then goes to meet with the leader of the city station, with Lord Biba, who no one trusts due to his known hatred for the shogunate. No one except for this stupid glasses guy, the ruler of the city station. Elsewhere, naive Mumei opens the gate fully to Wato Station, letting in Lord Biba's train, thinking everything is hunky-dory. And that was her most tragic mistake. All of a sudden, Lord Biba's train opens up and reveals thousands of kabane, along with more kabane being led right through the front gate, causing panic and killing everybody, shocking Mumei and making her realize that she was just a little pawn in Lord Biba's bigger scheme. And at that very same moment, back in the meeting room, Lord Biba kills Glasses Guy and his men, saying that this city needs to pay for the shogunate's mistakes all these years, and even takes Princess Ayame hostage. The Iron Fortress needs Princess Ayame's master key in order to start the train, so Kurusu goes to rescue her, while Lord Biba prepares even bigger plants, stabbing this blonde girl with a formula that turns her into another smoke monster. But with too much power comes insanity, and this chick loses her mind in the process, collapsing and going berserk until Lord Biba kills her. Her purpose has been fulfilled, and Lord Biba intends to use another test subject to use when they reach Kongukaku. Mumei is shocked at all of this, while Lord Biba calmly states that they will soon live in a world where only the strong will survive, showing everyone just how messed up this guy really is. And everything gets even bleaker, cause while Kurusu saves Princess Ayame, but then gets captured, everyone else in this innocent station, including children, die. And Ikuma also gets captured, along with Mumei. With everyone being captured, the train presses on to Kongukaku, and we find out that the prisoners are being forced to donate their blood for the Kabaneri. But Ikuma begins to make plans to escape, coordinating with his friends as to just how they'll do it. Elsewhere, Lord Biba convinces Princess Ayame to help him with his evil plans in exchange for the safety of her people. And in the process, we hear more about how Lord Biba was betrayed by his father. Later that night, Ikuma and his friends finally escape and take over control of their train cart and slowly take back one train cart at a time. This causes Lord Biba to ask Mumei to go kill Ikuma or he'll stop giving her the Kabane antidote, meaning
meaning she'll become a Kabane zombie. But surprisingly, Mume resists and then gets the shit kicked out of her. Because Lord Biba is even more horrifying than anyone could have predicted and even manages to trap Ikuma and his crew, revealing that he predicted Ikuma's plans all along and brutally kills Ikuma's best friend Takumi in the process, tearing him apart literally. Suddenly, a brainwashed Mume shows up to stab Ikuma, killing him and he descends into the ocean. However, the next day, Ikuma wakes up ashore on the beach. He's alive, but traumatized as all hell thanks to Lord Biba, who on the train injects brainwashed Mume with the same crazy formula as he did with Blonde Girl, meaning shit is about to go down, because word of Lord Biba's genocide at Wato Station finally reaches the Shogun at Kongukaku, but this Shogun is too cocky for his own dang good and prepares for what he thinks will be an easy battle. Just then, however, he gets word that the Iron Fortress has arrived with Lord Biba as their prisoner. At the front gate, Lord Biba and Princess Ayame exit the train, and this health officer states that there is a strict three-day quarantine procedure even for non-infected people, but then suddenly ignores that rule for Lord Biba and Princess Ayame like a dumbass. Okay, now I like Kongukaku style of quarantine, because here's the thing, we need to watch out for the incubation period, which is the time before the symptoms of a viral infection appear, which can vary highly depending on the disease in question. From the common cold having an incubation period of 1 to 3 days, to measles having 9 to 12 days, and stuff like the Kuru disease having an incubation period of an astonishing 10 to 13 years. Now from the looks of things, this virus has an incubation period somewhat similar to the common cold, lasting at most a couple of days before transformation. Although the medical literature out there does show that prolonged incubation in viruses is a thing, and that means for for starters, I would increase the quarantine procedure to at least double of what it is now. The Kabane virus does take at most a few days. This means that it is possible that some people could have a delayed response. And also, it's possible that some people's bodies could have a delayed response depending on how they got infected, whether it was through a small cut or a large bite. And secondly, it is apparent by everyone at Kongukaku that Lord Biba hates the Shogunate, which means I would not let him and Princess Aime through without employing standards security measures by having a tighter quarantine procedure and having a good old regular pat-down along with the confinement of Lord Biba and his subordinates. I'm just saying, if I was the Shogun and my psycho son paid me a visit, whether or not he was in chains, I'd still put him in a prison cell before paying him a visit. This town knows Biba is a psycho and a master of trickery, so the fact that they're being so chill about letting him visit the Shogun is beyond me, and this will cost them. Back on the cold, sandy beaches of nowhere, Scarred Ikuma hears a rustle and readies his weapon, only to find Kurusu popping up. Looks like he escaped, but unlike Ikuma, Kurusu hasn't given up and smacks some sense into Ikuma and reveals the most insane thing ever, revealing that there's no way Mume could have missed Ikuma's heart, which means she spared him on purpose. This means that the old Mume is still in there somewhere, and this lights a fire under Ikuma. But then he finds out from his captured evil scientist that there's no hope left to save Mume once she turns into the black smoke, unless Ikuma injects her in the heart with white plasma. Ikuma then does the unthinkable and demands that he be infected with the black blood that this evil scientist has on his person. This black blood is an accelerator for the Kabane virus, but it will also enhance all of his powers at the cost of his sanity. But because he's a man, he won't turn into the black smoke monster, just one badass all-powerful Kabaneri with a very, very short lifespan. And so Ikuma stabs his own chest and takes off his collar, allowing the full power of the Kabane virus to flow through his veins, making him stronger than any Kabaneri before him. Meanwhile, back at Kongukaku, Lord Biba kneels before the all-powerful shogunate, and the boss man takes out an old knife from his son's belongings that he remembers giving Lord Biba when he was a child. And so, sneaky Lord Biba plays on his nostalgia by begging his father, the shogun, to kill him with that weapon. And so the shogun agrees, ready his knife, he suddenly gets cut by it, and he begins to show signs that he's infected. Lord Biba then freaks everyone in the room out by saying that there are other Kabane hiding among the people, and even goes onto the intercom to let the people of Kongukaku know the same thing, that the Kabane are out among the people. Everyone, and I mean everyone, begin to freak out.
freak out. And what comes next is an absolute slaughter. Because nobody trusts anybody. And to make matters worse, Lord Biba pulls the same stunt that he did at Iwato Station, unleashing thousands of Kabane from his train doors, allowing the Kabane to quickly take over the fortress and countless people get slaughtered by the Kabane. Men, women, and children. While Mume as the Black Smoke continues to rain havoc across Kongukaku. Ikuma and Kurusu finally reach Kongukaku and take out Kabane after Kabane as they make their way to Mume, with a plan to inject Mume with the only white blood vial in existence, meaning Ikuma must give his life for Mume's. Elsewhere, Lord Biba orders the evacuation of his troops and his people as he readies to take care of some personal matters. And he intends to hunt down Ikuma himself. And Lord Biba finds Ikuma, who at the same time also finds Mume, prompting their battle over Mume's soul to begin. The two warriors then go at it, as battle-hardened Lord Biba slays and slashes Ikuma down to his knees, proving who the better warrior is, until Ikuma, through sheer will, manages to kill Lord Biba. A now exhausted and almost lifeless Ikuma forces himself to go inject the cure into Mume, reverting her back to her old self, and Ikuma passes out. But just then, Lord Biba comes back from the dead and demands Ikuma to continue to fight him until he gets a permanent timeout from his little sister, ending his reign of terror once and for all. Later, as hell continues to reign upon a ravaged Kongukaku, Lord Biba's men arrive at the Iron Fortress and make a deal with Princess Ayame. They'll show her the way out in exchange for letting them ride along with her, and she agrees, putting an end to the battle between the two factions that took so many lives lives. As the Iron Fortress makes its way out, they collect Ikuma, Kurusu, and Mume, and Mume continually pleads for Ikuma to come back to her, until he does, as we find out through convenient plot armor that Lord Biba ended up slipping Ikuma the only other white plasma in existence that he had on him, possibly indicating that in his last moments, Lord Biba finally managed to grow a heart. But literally, not one person gives this a second thought, as the Iron Fortress happily makes its way out of a destroyed Kongukaku with another destroyed city on their list, and them not a step closer to winning the war against the Kabane. But on the plus side, all the main heroes survive, except for Takumi. Poor, poor Takumi. But what do you guys think? Would you survive Kabaneri of the Iron Fortress? Let us know down in the comments below. Let us know what you like, what you didn't like, and as always, don't forget to check out our playlist and our social media.